and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This episode is part two of a two-part episode on the siege and ultimate fall of the city of Constantinople in the year 1453. So if you're just tuning in for the first time, you might want to go back to the last episode, which is entitled 1453, the most important year in history. That said, here is a quick recap of where we are picking up. May also be useful if you last listened to the first part a little while ago. In the year 1453, in the spring of that year, Ottoman Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror would besiege the city of Constantinople by land and by sea. And throughout the month of April, he would make various efforts to take the city by force, none of which are successful. Towards the end of April, he would ultimately move a good portion of his fleet across land. And where we are at this point in the battle, there are now a number of Ottoman ships inside the harbor, inside the Golden Horn. Tough to say exactly how many there are. There are 26 Byzantine ships, well, Byzantine, Genoan, and Venetian. And then there are between 30 and 70 Ottoman ships. Paul K. Davis, in his book 100 Decisive Battles, says 30. Donald M. Nickel, in The Immortal Emperor, says 70. Tough to say who's right. And just to reverse something I said last week, I misspoke. I said that the Ottoman ships were, by and large, bigger than the Genoese. Reverse that. It's the other way around. These Genoese ships are bigger. They're more modern. Most of them have sails instead of oars anymore. Uh, They're galleon-style ships, Uh, not necessarily your old-school, traditional Mediterranean galleys. Anyway, now that we are all caught up, we find ourselves in a little bit of a conundrum. Or should I say the Byzantine defenders of Constantinople do? They need to make some kind of response against this Ottoman fleet, So, after a bunch of bickering and infighting between the Venetians and the Genoans, they launch an assault on the night of April 28th, and they're going to use something called Greek fire. If you're a fan of military history, you may already be familiar with Greek fire. It's basically napalm. And it is sprayed through nozzles, almost like fire hoses, on these Byzantine ships, and they will pump it out and spray it onto enemy ships and light them up on fire. The problem with this is to make that kind of attack, you have to get very close. So the Byzantines are slowly crossing the harbor at night, very quietly, and an Ottoman spy has tipped off the sultan, who has positioned cannons to fire on the Byzantine fleet as they approach his fleet. And so, when he does this, the Byzantines are not expecting to have a bunch of cannons suddenly open fire from the land side as they're approaching the Turkish fleet, Uh, so they are forced to pull back, and only one Turkish ship is actually burned. The attack is pretty ineffective. That said, there is actually never any decisive naval battle between the fleets. Mehmed seems content to let his fleet serve as a block just to keep outside supplies from coming into the city of Constantinople, and he's going to let his land forces do the bulk of the work just having ships inside the Golden Horn is not enough to bring him victory. And so, for another week, Mehmed continues his bombardment. And on May 6th, 
a breach opens up, a hole in the wall near the center by the gate of St. Romanus. You might remember a fellow named Giovanni Justiniani. We introduced him last week. He is the mercenary captain, the very successful mercenary captain, who's an expert on siege warfare. Well, he's defending in this spot where the breach opens up, and rather than rebuild the wall directly in Mehmed's line of fire, he instead builds a new section of wall right behind it uh, where the breach is. And the repair is good enough that when the Turks attack the next day with 25,000 men, the few thousand defenders drive them back. Well, Mehmed goes on bombarding the wall, and on May 12th, another breach opens at the north end of the wall, near the Blanchern Palace, that is Constantine's personal residence, and that is the section of the wall that Emperor Constantine XI is personally defending. And when this breach opens up, he personally leads the Imperial Guard in defense and pushes the Turks back there as well. And while the bombardment is going on and Mehmed is opening up these breaches and trying to force his way through, he is also having tunnels dug. He has a number of Serbian miners in his employ, and from way back out in the Ottoman camp, they're going to dig underground out under the walls of Constantinople and get underneath them and set explosives and blow them up, right? Cave everything in. At least that is their plan. Uh, they dig 14 different tunnels over the ensuing week, trying to get to the walls, but the Byzantines have a mining defense expert. This fellow's a little bit more controversial. Depending on who you ask, he's either a German named Johannes Grant or a Scotsman named John Grant, but either way, he's one of Justiniani's men, and he's damn good at his job. Uh, he fills barrels with water. And then he watches the waves in the water to figure out which way the Ottomans are digging, right, where those tunnels are located. It's almost like I, I picture the cup of water in the movie Jurassic Park vibrating as the T-Rex gets closer. He's kind of watching that sort of effect, and... He directs a team to intercept all 14 tunnels and destroy them, and those teams are successful. Some of the tunnels are flooded, uh, some he undermines and then blows up before they can get to the wall, and others are burnt out with Greek fire. Ultimately, none of the Ottoman tunnels has any significant effect on the battle. Okay, if he can't go under the walls, maybe Mehmed can go over them. Historian Paul K. Davis describes this attempt, referring to Mehmed as Muhammad. He says, quote, Muhammad then determined to try scaling the walls. He had a large siege tower constructed and rolled into place before the Chirisius Gate, the northernmost opening in the city walls. Bombardment had destroyed one of the defending towers in the walls, and the siege tower was able to provide covering fire for Turks filling in the moat before the wall. In desperation, Constantine called for volunteers for an attack on the siege tower. It was unbelievably successful. Surprising the Turkish guards, the Byzantines broke pots of Greek fire on the wooden siege tower, while their compatriots spent the night rebuilding the city wall and its destroyed tower. The next morning, Muhammad saw only the charred remains of his assault machine smoldering before the newly reconstructed tower in the city wall. Unquote. At this point, things are starting to get tight on both sides. The Byzantine, Genoan, and Venetian defenders 
are waiting for an expected Venetian relief fleet with 30 ships full of reinforcements and supplies. This fleet could have arrived already had the Venetians not dithered about getting into the war in the first place, but never mind that. Uh, no one in the city is starving yet, but food is starting to get scarce, and prices are going up. Constantine orders the gold and silver from the churches to be melted down and given to the poor so they can buy food. There are even rumors that Constantine's chief advisor, Lucas Notaras, and Mehmed's grand vizier, Halil Pasha, are engaged in secret backroom negotiations to try and work out a peace deal both of them presumably against orders. And some of Constantine's advisors, including uh, Lucas Notaris, uh, urge him to escape the city of Constantinople and retreat to Moria, that Byzantine territory in southern Greece. And there he could become an emperor in exile and then return to take the city at a later time. Mehmed also urges Constantine to go to Moria. When Constantine sends him a message asking him to withdraw and offers to pay literally any sum of money in tribute, Mehmed replies, quote, Either I shall take this city, or the city will take me, dead or alive. If you will admit defeat and withdraw in peace... I shall give you the Peloponnese and other provinces for your brothers, and we shall be friends. If you persist in denying me peaceful entry into the city, I shall force my way in, and I shall slay you and all your nobles, and I shall slaughter all the survivors and allow my troops to plunder at will. The city is all I want, even if it is empty. Unquote. A few days later, Mehmed sends another offer, saying that anyone who wants to leave the city can go peacefully and take all their belongings. Constantine responds that the only way Constantinople will fall to the Turks is by God's will. This is ride or die for both Mehmed and Constantine. Mehmed himself is under great pressure to end the siege. His advisors are upset about the costs and there are military threats on the horizon elsewhere. For example, the Hungarians, who have a truce with the Ottomans, have sent a delegation to tell him that if he is not at peace with Byzantium, then the Hungarian truce with the Ottomans is going to be off. Mehmed has delayed meeting the delegation, but eventually he's going to have to send an answer. If he can take the city quickly enough, it will be a moot point, though. He can't indefinitely keep his entire army outside Constantinople. He has to break through or at some point give up. Twenty-three armies have tried and failed to conquer this city. Is it really realistic for Mehmed to think that he can succeed where they have all failed? He and his generals ultimately agree on one final assault. This will be an all-in effort, throwing the entire Ottoman force against the weakest part of the Byzantine Wall. That is the central section commanded by Giovanni Justiniani. As the fateful day approaches, the tactics on both sides start to get more brutal. Mehmed orders many of the Christian prisoners beheaded, and the Byzantines respond by hanging a number of Turkish prisoners from the city wall. The day before the attack, May 28th, Mehmed orders a day of rest and the city's defenders know something is up. It's too quiet. The usual 
harassing and probing attacks are not happening. There's just no activity whatsoever. Now, Constantinople on May 28th is already in a state of malaise. There have been a number of omens. For one thing, an old Byzantine prophecy says that the city will not fall as long as the moon is in the sky. Well, on the night of May 22nd, there had been a lunar eclipse. Possibly the most famous of these omens, though, is a bizarre one. On May 26th, there was an intense thunderstorm with lightning striking furiously all around the Hagia Sophia. That is the Grand Cathedral of Constantinople, and at the time, the greatest church in the Eastern Orthodox faith. And after the day of storms and lightning, there was a strange ghostly light around the dome of the Hagia Sophia at night. This is well attested by sources on both sides of the siege. And some of the people in the city said that it was the light of the Holy Spirit leaving the cathedral. Anyway, everybody's already in a state of malaise. Now the Turkish camp has gone relatively quiet. So, on May 28th, Constantine orders a mass to be held, and it's attended by almost everyone in the city other than the soldiers who are actively keeping watch on the walls. Italians and Greeks alike attend. Catholics and Orthodox attend. All take part in the worship and a procession through the city. At the end of this, Constantine gives a speech mostly to his men, but in public. And this is a speech which historian Edward Gibbon calls the funeral oration of the Roman Empire. This is the version recorded by Leonardo of Chios, an eyewitness to the speech. And I take it here from Donald M. Nichols' book, The Immortal Emperor. Constantine says, quote, Gentlemen, illustrious captains of the army and our most Christian comrades in arms, we now see the hour of battle approaching. I have therefore elected to assemble you here to make it clear that you must stand together with firmer resolution than ever. You have always fought with glory against the enemies of Christ. Now, the defense of your fatherland and the city known the world over, which the infidel and evil Turks have been besieging for two and fifty days, is committed to your lofty spirits. Be not afraid because its walls have been worn down by the enemy's battering. For your strength lies in the protection of God, and you must show it with your arms quivering and your swords brandished against the enemy. I know that this undisciplined mob will, as is their custom, rush upon you with loud cries and ceaseless volleys of arrows. These will do you no bodily harm, for I see that you are well covered in armor. They will strike the walls, our breastplates, and our shields. So do not imitate the Romans who, when the Carthaginians went into battle against them, allowed their cavalry to be terrified by the fearsome sight and sounds of the elephants. In this battle, you must stand firm and have no fear, no thought of flight, but be inspired to resist with ever more Herculean strength. Animals may run away from animals, but you are men, men of stout heart, and you will hold at bay these dumb brutes, thrusting your spears and swords into them, so that they will know that they are fighting not against their own kind, but against masters of animals." You are aware that the impious and infidel enemy has disturbed the peace unjustly. He has violated the oath and treaty that he made with us. He has slaughtered our farmers at harvest time. 
he has erected a fortress on the Propontis, as it were, to devour the Christians. He has encircled Galata under a pretense of peace. Now he threatens to capture the city of Constantine the Great, your fatherland, the place of ready refuge for all Christians, the guardian of all Greeks, and to profane its holy shrines of God by turning them into stables for his horses. My lords, my brothers, my sons, the everlasting honor of Christians is in your hands. You men of Genoa, men of courage and famous for your infinite victories, you who have always protected this city, your mother, in many a conflict with the Turks, now show your prowess and your aggressive spirit towards them with manly vigor. You men of Venice, most valiant heroes, whose swords have many a time made Turkish blood to flow, and who in our time have sent so many ships, so many infidel souls to the depths under the command of Loredano, the most excellent captain of our fleet. You who have adorned this city as if it were your own with fine outstanding men, lift high your spirits now for battle. You, my comrades in arms, obey the commands of your leaders and the knowledge that this is the day of your glory a day on which, if you shed but a drop of blood, you will win for yourselves crowns of martyrdom and eternal fame. Unquote. After his speech, Constantine personally prepares to die. He confesses his sins to a priest and he returns briefly to his palace to personally apologize to some family members and servants for anything he may have done to offend them. And then he takes his place on the walls with his men to wait through the night with them. Mehmed's plan is to assault with three waves of troops. The first wave is the weakest. It's made up of what are called Bashi Bazooks. This is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious force of militia troops who are poorly armed and badly disciplined and really just fight for whatever plunder they can get their hands on. As a matter of fact, the term Bashi Bazook literally means crazy head. But the point of this first attack is to tie the defenders down and get them fighting and start wearing them out. The second wave of Mehmed's troops is going to be his standard infantry. These are much tougher troops. They are professional soldiers, and they are a good bit better disciplined than the Bashi Bazooks. And this wave is going to further wear down the defenders and tire them out. And if his regular standard infantry can't get through, Mehmed is then going to deploy the third wave, his elite heavy infantry, the Janissaries. And this third wave will strike defenders who are pretty tired out from a long fight already. As I said, the main attack will be aimed against the center of the wall, Justiniani's section, where the most damage has been done by the Turkish cannons, but there will also be a secondary attack against the northern part of the wall to tie down some of the defenders. The assault is to begin at 2 a.m., about three hours before dawn on May 29th, 1453. The following is the story of the battle as told by one of the participants. Now, this man, Niccolo Barbaro, is a physician on a Venetian galley. And he is a little bit biased. We'll have to stop a couple times to clear up some inaccuracies in his account. 
Uh, for one thing, his estimate of Ottoman troop numbers is about double what they actually were. And that's par for the course with these primary sources for the battle. Uh, for another thing, uh, Barbaro describes the Bashi bazooks as Christians when they're really just a general mob. It's multi-religious and multi-ethnic. And it, as happens often with these kinds of sources, there is some casual anti-Semitism thrown in as well. But what are you going to do? We work with the sources we have. Anyway, this is Niccolo Barbaro's account of the fall of Constantinople. Quote, on the 29th of May, 1453, three hours before daybreak, Mohammed Bey, son of Murat the Turk, came himself to the walls of Constantinople to begin the general assault which gained him the city. The sultan divided his troops into three groups of 50,000 men each. One group was of Christians who were kept in his camp against his will. The second group was of men of a low condition, peasants and the like and the third group was of Janissaries in their white turbans, these being all soldiers of the sultan and paid every day, all well-armed men, strong in battle. And behind these Janissaries were all the officers, and behind these the Turkish sultan. The first group, which was the Christians, had the task of carrying the ladders to the walls, and they tried to raise the ladders up, and at once we threw them to the ground with the men who were raising them and they were all killed at once, and we threw big stones down on them from the battlements, so that few escaped alive. In fact, anyone who approached beneath the walls was killed. When those who were raising up the ladders saw so many dead, they tried to retreat towards their camp so as not to be killed by the stones, and when the rest of the Turks who were behind saw that they were running away, at once they cut them down to pieces with their scimitars and made them turn back towards the walls, so that they had the choice of dying on one side or the other. And when this first group was killed and cut to pieces, the second group began to attack vigorously. The first group was sent forward for two reasons. Firstly, because they preferred that Christians should die rather than Turks, and secondly, to wear us out in the city. And as I have said, when the first group was dead or wounded, the second group came on like lions unchained against the walls on the side of San Romano. And when we saw this fearful thing, at once the alarm bell was sounded through the whole city, and at every post on the walls, and every man ran crying out to help. And the Eternal God showed us his mercy against these Turkish dogs, so that every man ran toward off the attack of the pagans, and they began to fall back outside the Barbicans. But this second group was made up of brave men, who came up to the walls and wearied those in the city greatly by their attack. They also made a great attempt to raise ladders up to the walls, but the men on the walls bravely threw them down to the ground again, and many Turks were killed. Also, our crossbows and cannon kept on firing into their camp at this time, and killed an incredible number of Turks. When the second group had come forward and attempted unsuccessfully to get into the city, then there approached the third group, their paid soldiers the Janissaries, and their officers and their other principal commanders, all very brave men, and the Turkish sultan behind them all. This third group attacked the walls of the poor city not like Turks, but like lions, with such shouting and sounding of castanets that it seemed a thing not of this world, and the shouting was heard as far away as Anatolia, twelve miles away from their camp. This third group of Turks, all fine fighters, found those on the walls very weary after having fought with the first and second groups, while the pagans were eager and fresh for the battle and with the loud cries which they uttered on the field, they spread fear through the city and took away our courage with their shouting and noise. The wretched people in the city felt themselves to have been taken already and decided to sound the alarm bell through the whole city and sounded it at all the posts on the walls, all crying at the top of their voices, Mercy, mercy, 
God send help from heaven to this empire of Constantine, so that a pagan people may not rule over the empire. All through the city, all the women were on their knees, and all the men, too, praying most earnestly and devotedly to our omnipotent God and his mother Madonna St. Mary, with all the sainted men and women of the celestial hierarchy to grant us victory over this pagan race, these wicked Turks, enemies of the Christian faith. While these supplications were being made, the Turks were attacking fiercely on the landward side by San Romano, by the headquarters of the most serene emperor and all his nobles, and his principal knights and his bravest men, who all stayed by him fighting bravely. The Turks were attacking, as I have said, like men determined to enter the city, by San Romano on the landward side, firing their cannon again and again, with so many other guns and arrows without number, and shouting from these pagans that the very air seemed to be split apart. And they kept on firing their great cannon, which fired a ball weighing twelve hundred pounds, and their arrows, all along the length of the walls on the side where their camp was, a distance of six miles, so that inside the Barbicans at least eighty camel loads of them were picked up, and as many as twenty camel loads of those which were in the ditch. This fierce battle lasted until daybreak. Our men of Venice did marvels of defense in the part where the bastion was, where the Turks were concentrating their attack. But it was useless. Since our eternal God had already made up his mind that the city should fall into the hands of the Turks, and since God had so determined, nothing further could be done. Except that all we Christians who found ourselves at this time in the wretched city should place ourselves in the hands of our merciful Lord Jesus Christ and of his mother, Madonna St. Mary, for them to have mercy on the souls of those who had to die in the battle on this day. One hour before daybreak, the sultan had his great cannon fired, and the shot landed in the repairs which we had made and knocked them down to the ground. Nothing could be seen for the smoke made by the cannon, and the Turks came on under cover of the smoke, and about three hundred of them got inside the Barbicans. The Greeks and Venetians fought hard and drove them out of the Barbicans, and a great number died, including almost all of those who were able to get inside. After the Greeks had fought this fight, they thought that they had indeed won the victory against the pagans, and we Christians were greatly relieved. But after being driven back from the Barbicans, the Turks again fired their great cannon and the pagans like hounds came on behind the smoke of the cannon, raging and pressing on each other like wild beasts, so that in the space of a quarter of an hour there were more than thirty thousand Turks inside the Barbicans, with such cries that it seemed a very inferno, and the shouting was heard as far away as Anatolia. When the Turks got inside the Barbicans, they quickly captured the first row of them, but before they managed this, a great number of them died at the hands of those who were above them on the walls, who killed them with stones at their pleasure. After having captured the first row, the Turks, together with the Exapi, made themselves strong there, and then there came inside the Barbicans a good seventy thousand Turks with such force that it seemed a very inferno. And soon the Barbicans, from one end to the other, a full six miles, were full of Turks. As I have said before, those on the walls killed a great number of Turks with stones, casting them down from above without stopping, and so many were killed that forty carts could not have carried away the dead Turks who had died before getting into the city. We Christians were now very frightened. The emperor had the alarm bell sounded through the whole city, and at the posts on the walls with every man crying, Mercy, Eternal God! Men cried out, and women too, and the nuns and the young children most loudly of all, and there was such lamentation that even the most cruel Jew would have felt pity. Seeing this, Giovanni Justiniani, that Genoese of Genoa, decided to abandon his post, and fled to his ship, which was lying at the boom. The emperor had made this Giovanni Justiniani captain of his forces, and as he fled, he went through the city crying, The Turks have got into the city! But he lied in his teeth, because the Turks were not yet inside. 
When the people heard their captain's words that the Turks had got into the city, they all began to take flight, and all abandoned their posts at once, and went rushing towards the harbor in the hope of escaping in the ships and the galleys. Unquote. Now, I'm going to stop here because, quite frankly, this description is libelous at best. Uh, this account was written at a time of intense political conflict between the Venetians and the Genoans, and our writer is a Venetian. Right. Let's go back to what he said. First, he drops his little bit of casual anti-Semitism, and then he goes on and he says, Giovanni Justiniani, that Genoese of Genoa decided to abandon his post. He also, by the way, has conveniently left out the fact that there were Genoese troops at the walls. He talks about the Byzantines and the Venetians. Right, this is part factual account, part propaganda, as are so many things. Justiniani did not run away from his post and single-handedly cause a panic. Here's how it really happened. Probably. So, the defenders are holding on and holding their own against the Janissaries. And they're exhausted at this point. It's about seven in the morning, give or take. There have been more than five hours of fighting. And at this point, Justiniani, who is fighting in the front line, not running away in panic, is wounded. Most likely, he's hit by a crossbow bolt. But regardless, he goes into the city to have his wound treated, but it is a serious injury, and he does have to be helped off the field. And so his men, as well as the other defenders, the Venetians and the Byzantines in the area, they just see a wounded Justiniani being rushed off the field by his personal guards. This is cause for concern, but in and of itself, it does not cause them to break. Right? They are still holding their own, and the Ottomans have not yet broken into the city. But then, up at the north end of the wall, another thing happens. Right? Remember, I mentioned that there was an attack not just at the center of the wall, but also up at the north well, up at the north end, there is a small postern gate, a little man-sized gate in one of the towers that some of the Byzantines accidentally left unlocked. And a handful of Turkish soldiers find this. Probably about five or ten Turkish soldiers find this gate and get into the tower and they go up top and they raise the sultan's flag. Now, Again, in isolation, this event is not a big deal. This is five or ten guys going into a tower and hoisting a flag. It's symbolic. It's a little bit of mischief. I remember these are professional soldiers. Soldiers do have their own peculiar sense of humor. And this is the kind of mischief some guys might get up to. Hey, look, we got your tower. But... Justiniani's men, way down at the center of the line, right, who have just seen their leader rushed off, now they see up at the north end of the wall the sultan's flag flying from one of the towers. But they don't have context for this. They think the city's already falling. So they retreat. Justiniani is loaded onto a galley and evacuated. So he does indeed flee the city, but it doesn't matter. He dies of his wound two days later. And he certainly does not run through the streets screaming that the Turks have gotten in. From all accounts, he is in no condition to be running, much less screaming and causing a panic. Regardless, now the troops in the center of the wall are starting to fall back into the city. 
they have left a path for the Turks to get inside. And without his head commander, with Justiniani out of commission, Constantine himself has to lead a relief force to try and turn things around, but he is too late. By the time he arrives, Mehmed has seen the Genoan retreat, identified his opportunity, and dispatched fresh Janissaries through the gap, and they take the Adrianople Gate. And now Ottoman troops are free to enter into the city. Now let's continue with Niccolo Barbaro's account. He continues, quote, At this moment of confusion, which happened at sunrise, our omnipotent God came to his most bitter decision and decided to fulfill all the prophecies. As I have said, and at sunrise, the Turks entered the city near San Romano, where the walls had been raised to the ground by their cannon. But before they entered, there was such a fierce struggle between the Turks and the Christians in the city who opposed them, and so many of them died, that a good twenty carts could have been filled with the corpses of the first Turks. Then the second wave followed the first and went rushing about the city, and any one they found they put to the scimitar, women and men, old and young, of any condition. This butchery lasted from sunrise when the Turks entered the city until midday, and anyone whom they found was put to the scimitar in their rage. Those of our merchants who escaped hid themselves in underground places, and when the first mad slaughter was over, they were found by the Turks and were all taken and sold as slaves. The Turks made eagerly for the piazza, five miles from the point where they made their entrance at San Romano. And when they reached it, at once some of them climbed up a tower where the flags of St. Mark and the Most Serene Emperor were flying, and they cut down the flag of St. Mark, and took away the flag of the Most Serene Emperor. And then on the same tower they raised the flag of the Sultan. When they had taken away these two flags, those of St. Mark and the Emperor, and raised the flag of the Turkish dog, then all we Christians who were in the city were full of sorrow, because it had been captured by the Turks. When their flag was raised and ours cut down, we saw that the whole city was taken, and that there was no further hope of recovering from this. Now I shall tell of the events at sea, since I have told of what happened on land. One hour before dawn, the fleet got under way from the columns where it was anchored, and it took up a position by the harbor boom, ready to give battle there. But their admiral saw that our harbor was well defended with ships and galleys, particularly at the boom where there were ten large ships of eight hundred bot and upwards. Those are just very large ships. And since he was afraid of our fleet, he decided to go and fight behind the city on the side of the Dardanelles, and leave the harbor without fighting. And so they went on land there, part of them disembarking by the Geodesa, so as to have better opportunity of getting booty, there being great riches in the houses of the Jews, particularly jewels. The seventy ships inside the harbor which had been dragged over the hill of Pera, commanded by Zagan Pasha, all went together and attacked the city at a place called Fenari, and the Christians on this part of the walls bravely drove them back. But when the men in these ships saw that the Christians had lost Constantinople, and that the standards of Mohammed Bey the Turk was raised over the principal tower of the city, and that the standards of St. Mark and the Emperor had been cut down and lowered, then they all disembarked. And at the same time, all those in the fleet on the Dardanelles side disembarked, and left their ships by the shore without anyone in them because they were all running furiously like dogs into the city to seek out gold, jewels, and other treasure, and to take merchants prisoner. They sought out the monasteries, and all the nuns were led to the fleet and ravished and abused by the Turks, and then sold at auction for slaves throughout Turkey. And all the young women were also ravished, and then sold for whatever they would fetch, although some of them preferred to cast themselves into the wells and drown, rather than fall into the hands of the Turks, as did a number of married women also. 
The Turks loaded all their ships with prisoners and with an enormous quantity of booty. Their practice was that when they went into a house, at once they raised up a flag with their emblem on it. And when other Turks saw this flag flying, they left this house alone and went in search of another house without a flag. And so they put their flags everywhere, even on the monasteries and churches. As far as I can estimate, there would have been 200,000 of these flags flying on the houses all over Constantinople. Some houses had as many as 10, because of the excitement which the Turks felt at having won such a great victory. For the rest of the day, these flags were kept flying on the houses, and all through the day, the Turks made a great slaughter of Christians throughout the city. The blood flowed in the city like rainwater in the gutters after a sudden storm, and the corpses of Turks and Christians were thrown into the Dardanelles, where they floated out to sea like melons along a canal. No one could hear any news of the emperor, what he had been doing, or whether he was dead or alive. Some said that his body had been seen among the corpses, and it was said that he had hanged himself at the moment when the Turks broke in at the San Romano Gate. Unquote. Now, this is also inaccurate, although it is understandable since Barbaro is writing based on rumor in a very confused time. It is unclear what exactly happened to Constantine the Eleventh, how exactly he died. There are are as many accounts of the event as there are stories of the battle, but the mainstream historical consensus these days is that Constantine the Eleventh died bravely in battle alongside his men, leading a last desperate charge to push the Ottomans back. Constantine charges into the thickest part of the fighting and disappears into the fray. And with him disappears the last of a political legacy that dates as far back as Julius Caesar. Fitting, perhaps, that the last Roman Empire, the last of that lineage, should die fighting. Anyway, Barbaro concludes his story by telling us about the escape of the Venetian and Genoese fleet. He says, quote, When we reached the boom, we could not get past it, because it stretched all the way between the two cities of Constantinople and Para. That's what a lot of the uh, Genoan sources call Galata. Uh, but two brave men leapt down onto one of the wooden sections of the boom, and with a couple of axes cut through it, and we quickly hauled ourselves outside it, and sailed to a place called the Columns behind Para, where the Turkish fleet had been anchored. Here in this place we waited until midday to see if any of our merchants could reach the galleys, but none of them were able to do so because they had all been captured." So, at midday, with the help of our Lord God, Aluvixi Diedo, the captain of the galleys from Tana, made sail on his galley, and then the galley of Jerusalemeo Morexini, and the galley of Trebizond, with its vice-master Dolphine Dolphine, did the same. This galley of Trebizond had great difficulty in getting its sails up, because a hundred and sixty-four of its crew were missing some of them drowned, some dead in the bombardment or killed in other ways during the fighting, so that they could only just manage to raise their sails. The light galley of Cabriel Trivixian set sail, although he himself was still in the city in the hands of the Turks. The galley of Candia, with Zachariah Grioni the knight as master, was captured. Then behind these galleys there sailed three ships of Candia under Zwan Venier, and Antonio Filamati, the hen. And we all sailed safely together, ships and galleys, out through the straits, with the north wind blowing at more than twelve miles an hour. Had there been a calm or a very light breeze, we would have all been captured. When we set sail for Constantinople, 
The whole of the Turkish fleet was unarmed, and all the captains and crews had gone into the city to sack it. You can be sure that if their fleet had been in action, not a single vessel could have escaped, but the Turks would have had them as prizes of war, because we were shut up inside the boom, but they abandoned their fleet. Fifteen ships stayed inside the harbor, belonging to the Genoese, to the Emperor, and to the people of Ancona. Also, all the emperor's galleys, numbering five, which had been disarmed. And also there stayed all the other vessels which were in the harbor. And the ships and galleys which could not escape were all captured by the Turks. But apart from these fifteen ships, seven belonging to the Genoese which were by the boom escaped. And one which was off Para, belonging to Zorizi Doria of Genoa, of about 2,400 boat, escaped with the other seven towards evening. The fighting lasted from dawn until noon, and while the massacre went on in the city, everyone was killed. But after that time, they were all taken prisoner. Our ambassador, Jerusalemeo Minato, had his head cut off by order of the sultan. And this was the end of the capture of Constantinople which took place in the year 1453 on the 29th of May, which was a Tuesday. Unquote. It is difficult to put a number on these things, but it's estimated that 50,000 people, give or take, the entire population of Constantinople are enslaved that day. A few days later, lookouts on the 30 Venetian relief ships would spot the Sultan's banners flying over the city. Too late, they would turn around and go home. Mehmed the Conqueror does not view himself as having destroyed the Byzantine Empire. He sees it as being under new management, and he has himself crowned Caesar e Rome, Caesar of the Roman Empire, the title used by Byzantine emperors, who in turn saw themselves as a continuation of Rome. Immediately upon taking over the city, he goes to the top of the Hagia Sophia, climbs the dome to the highest point in the city to survey everything he has just conquered. He will not destroy this city. He will certainly not destroy the Hagia Sophia. You don't destroy the great architectural marvel you just conquered. If you are Mehmed, you build minarets on it and turn it into a mosque. Same landmark, new management. Mehmed also dispenses some justice in the days following the siege. He will execute his vizier, Halil Pasha, as well as Constantine's chief advisor, Lucas Notaris, during this time. Most likely because these men have been conducting some unauthorized talks behind his back. Notaris initially tries to buy Mehmed's approval with money by offering him some coins he had stashed away and Mehmed dresses him down and asks him why he did not give that money to his emperor when he so badly needed it. During the rest of his life, Mehmed would conquer the rest of the old Byzantine Empire. By 1460, he would own all of Greece, and by 1461, he would have taken the last Byzantine holdouts in Trebizond. Incidentally, he would be instrumental in kicking the Genoans out of Crimea around the same time, ensuring for a period 
Islamic dominance of the entire eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea coast. He would expand Ottoman reach across the Balkans and solidify his hold on Serbia. Mehmed, in his final days, would even launch an invasion of Italy, although that would not go as he intended. Mehmed's descendants, within just a few generations, would go on to conquer much of the Middle East and Egypt and North Africa and even Arabia. They would reunite much of the Muslim world and create one of the largest empires in history. But Mehmed is not just Mehmed the Conqueror. He is also a ruler, and he seems to want to rule his empire as a leader for all the people. He is not just the Ottoman Sultan, he is the Caesar of the Romans. And so he allows the Orthodox Church to continue operating and cooperates with the new patriarch and even orders the patriarch to have the Orthodox Church doctrines translated into Turkish. So, while the Eastern and Western Christian churches had nearly reunited, the fall of Constantinople ensured that the breach would remain in place. Mehmed continues to foster his city, which he has taken over, which, by the way, he makes his new capital, among other things, he founds a university there, and he hires the greatest minds in the Muslim world to come and teach there. And on the 25th anniversary of his conquest, in the year 1478, Mehmed orders a census to be held in Constantinople. It finds a population of 80,000 larger than the population before the siege. Although it has a new demographic, a little over half the population is now Muslim as opposed to Christian, but many of the old Greeks are still there. In addition to its new population, the city of Constantinople gets a new name, Istanbul. Now, this isn't actually intentional. Mehmed himself refers to the city as Constantinople, but Istanbul is Greek for the phrase, in the city, and as opposed to outside the city, I guess. Uh, Istanbul is what the local Greeks have called the city of Constantinople for a few centuries at this point. And so the incoming Ottomans simply start using the same name that the locals do. And well, after all, in all of the Ottoman Empire, indeed all of the Eastern Mediterranean, there is no greater city than Constantinople. So when you say in the city, everyone knows which one you're talking about. The name stuck. The Turkish Empire, forged by Mehmed and his descendants, would fundamentally transform the eastern Mediterranean. Huge swaths of land that had been Greek since the classical era are now Turkish. This is a new nation, with its own traditions and history and mythos, and it is a nation that still exists today in the form of modern-day Turkey. But the impact of Mehmed's conquest is much greater than a single city or even the Turkish nation. 
Mehmed's conquest of the greatest of cities sends ripple effects throughout the world. For one thing, the collapse of the Greek Empire would send a flood of scholars westward, fueling the Renaissance, which was already in its early stages. And moreover, as the Ottomans came to dominate the eastern Mediterranean, they came to dominate trade with India and China. This would lead to the slow decline of Venice and Genoa as major powers, although the Venetians in particular would flex some serious naval muscle for a long time and even give the Ottomans a whole lot of trouble. If you were familiar with the Battle of Lepanto, you already know that story. The Ottoman Empire will institute high tariffs on this trade that they dominate with the East. And these taxes that they impose will be so high that they will encourage European powers, particularly Western coastal European powers, to look for a new route to India. Within 30 years of the fall of Constantinople, Portuguese explorers are already mapping the west coast of Africa, establishing small trading posts as they go. Eventually, they will find their way around. Just a few years after that, a Genoan sea captain named Cristoforo Colombo would receive funding from the Spanish crown for a journey westward across the Atlantic. The rest of that story is history. And that's why it's relevant. Greetings once again, it's Dan, and I'm here to let you know about a few things we're doing to expand the relevant history universe. For one thing, if you had not heard about it yet, we do have a Patreon channel. You can find the link to that in the description, and what this channel offers is exclusive access, yes, exclusive for members only, to a new series called Dan's War College. This is a monthly video series with videos... Uh, about a half hour long, where I myself, Dan Toller, explore and break down military battles or units or tactics from history and explain why they worked or didn't work, as the case may be. You get all of this, as well as a shout-out on the main Relevant History show for $5 a month. Alternatively, if you would like to support the show... Uh, with a smaller contribution, you can also find a link in the episode description to the Salad Tossers Patreon network. Now, as you might imagine, this is a network of more irreverent creators, and on their channel, I show a little bit more irreverent side. That series is called Irrelevant History, and there we discuss... Interesting historical novelties, such as the bear that served in the Polish army in World War II. Once again, you can find the link to that in the episode description as well, and that comes at the low, low price of $1 per month. But you don't have to spend money to support the show. As a matter of fact, one of the most helpful things you could do is leave a review or a nice positive rating on one of the many podcast distribution services. If you listen on iTunes or Google Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you happen to listen, if you leave a review or a rating, it really does help other people find the show. And while you're at it, make sure to share and tell your friends. If you like it, chances are you know a few other people who will as well. 
Last but not least, if you want to get a hold of me, whether because I made a mistake or whatever other reason you'd like to get in touch, you can find Relevant History on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T O L E R Podcast. Or you can find the show on Facebook at Dan Toller. That's Dan Toller. And it will be the Dan Toller with the Relevant History logo, not one of the individual people profiles out there. Uh, finally, you can send me an email at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast at gmail.com. For all other show-related things, including links to my blog posts, which have not been updated in quite some time, well, you can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.